cab driver Michael Bolden and his passenger, a mother of three from Seattle, Sandra Sutton Wasman. The shootout began in a parking lot with two men arguing over a girl. Kenneth Cherry Jr., the dead Maserati driver, and Namar Harris, the shooter, were both known Vegas pimps. Vegas's top vice cop warns pimps and buyers of sex that police here have zero tolerance for trafficking. Stand right here. We have a very aggressive police department that uh, polices that crime and all the all the crimes that are associated with that subculture. We're going to be doing a reversal here at uh, Dottie's My Oregon Boulder. Twice a week, Vegas Metro PD operates a reverse sting, which means they send out a female undercover or a UC posing as a prostitute. Uh, the guys that go down there to look for the flavor of the day um, and look to pick up a juvenile, look to pick up a girl that's involved in prostitution, we're going to find something just a little bit different today. We meeting down there right now? Yeah. All right. The team breaks and heads out to a known track where Lieutenant Hughes hopes to snag unsuspecting Johns looking for an early morning special. Typically, my guys work nights, but we change it up a lot to keep not just the demand side guessing, but also the girls that are regular track, track girls, keep them guessing about when Vice is out and when we're doing operations. All right, she's out. With the undercover cars in place, all eyes are on the decoy. Today we're going to put um, the best female you see that I've ever had an opportunity to work around. Uh, we're going to put her out, and um, she's probably going to be highly successful. In a matter of seconds, the decoy attracts the attention of a John. Okay. Lieutenant Hughes and her team look on as the two discuss a deal for oral sex. The decoy signals to officers that the deal has been made and heads back to the safe car. All right, it's down. He's driving uh, northbound to the lot. <laughs> Undercover detectives chase the John's car until he's out of sight of the operation. Put your hands on the steering wheel, sir. 48-year-old huh? Alvin Hakana has no idea why he's being pulled over. In favor, step out. Put it in park. There you go. Stand around for me, sir. Oh, no. Turn around. Turn around, sir. Clearly distressed, Hakana has much to lose. He's been married for 20 years and is in Vegas with his wife. I didn't even offer not. Okay, we're just yeah. we're gonna bring you over here, okay? I'm gonna move your car right over here. Oh, I'm from Hawaii. I don't know how I'm gonna do this. No, no, no. We're moving around. Okay, okay. As humiliating as the arrest might be for Hokana, Lieutenant Hughes says officers are saving this tourist and other Johns from potentially a far worse fate. We've got violent crimes, not, not just with the victims, but also against the tricks. I'm gonna pull up right over there, okay? They get drugged, they get stabbed, they get uh, carjacked, um, and law enforcement has to police that element as well. So you don't know what's in here? It's, it's not a key. Map. Take your ring off and take that rubber band off. And it goes the mouth. Let me see your new tongue. Pull up your top lip. Take your fingers and pull it up. Bottom lip, pull it down. Shirt, pull it up to your chest. Start to see your armpits. This tourist from Hawaii was just looking for cheap sex. Now he's just one of several thousand men each year caught in a Las Vegas metro prostitution sting. Okay, standing in that red box right there. People need to know that the demand drives prostitution. If we choose not to police that, the message we send is that it's okay. This smooth-talking Romeo thinks he's about to pay $25 for oral sex. What he doesn't know is that this attractive woman is actually an undercover officer, and eight sets of eyes are watching him.
the John chit chats the decoy before confirming the dollar amount for sex. To sweeten the deal, he offers to supply her with high end clients. With Las Vegas Metro PD recording every word, the decoy tells the man to wait for her around the corner while she turns a quick date. He said that uh, that basically I was a good-looking girl out here. He said that we could make a lot of money together. He wanted 10% of my earnings, and my starting fees would be $500 an hour for sex. Officers move in to grab the John. He said he's over here by the shell. He went inside the shell like the Hispanic-looking guy, got a little mustache, got a big old hoop earring in his right ear. Detectives arrest 48-year-old Mario Ferreira. In addition to soliciting sex because he offered to provide the decoy with clients for a cut of the cash, Ferreira will also be charged with felony pandering. Come on over here, we're going to go in the front. Yes, sir. For this particular guy, I think he's just an opportunist. He's not what we would typically um, see out here uh, as a pimp. He's probably just looking for a way to make an easy buck. All right, have a seat. Yes, sir. We're going to drive you over to another oh, lot, okay? Okay. Relax. All right. You'll be all right. Ouch, ouch, ouch. Ooh. Already facing a pandering charge, Ferreira's luck takes a turn for the worse when officers discover a hide a key that appears to be concealing an illegal substance. So you don't know what's in here? It's, it's not a key. Oh, man. Meth. That's even worse. Is that what you do? No. I'm an entertainer by trade, sir. Entertainer? Yes, sir. Like what? A stripper? No. Uh, if you go to America's Got Talent season four, I was a chainsaw juggler and made top ten there. Chainsaw juggler? Yes, comedy juggler. Ferreira's denial about the drugs may sound improbable, but his claim that he was once a hot Las Vegas entertainer turns out to be true. A few years ago, Ferreira and his wife hit it big when they made it to America's Got Talent with their chainsaw juggling performance. What will you be doing for us today? It's going to be a combination of sexy mm -hmm. and dangerous. We like that. Let's do it. But Ferreira's luck ran out. His Vegas stage act was canceled and his wife divorced him. While Ferreira's performing days on the Vegas Strip may be over, he continued putting on quite a show for detectives. Was that back before you started using meth? I don't use meth, man. I mean, I party, I dabble here and there, you know, as an entertainer. You used it before, right? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. So what makes it, how did it get in your pocket today? That's it. Just these pants are not mine. I mean, I don't even know that. You know how many times I've heard that? Why would I keep it right there? You know how many times I've heard these pants are mine, that's not my jacket. Yes, a million times over. Just when Ferreira thought things couldn't get any worse, officers make a new discovery. He's got all these dealership keys. There's a bunch of dealerships on Boulder Highway. And actually, he lives over there off of Boulder Highway. So he's got all these car keys. So we're going to impound him and follow up on the dealership down there, see if he's uh, boosting cars or whatever. Incredibly, this pile of evidence could be the least of Ferreira's problems. As chance would have it, the processing officer recognizes Ferreira not as a TV performer, but as a suspect who ran from him in a recent drug bust. Hey, this was Ferreira, right? Yeah. Yeah. He robbed his dad's house. He ran from us on a scooter. We booked his boy. He threw a whole bunch of dope away and jumped on a scooter. I can't tell you how happy I am to finally meet you. Watch your foot. I've been raped in beautiful $30,000 suites before with guns in my head. Turn your body to the right, the other right. Today, Mario Ferreira, once known for his chainsaw juggling act, is trading in his chainsaws for chains at the Clark County Jail in Vegas. Where'd you be? Unlike the other Johns caught in today's dragnet, Ferreira faces the more serious charge of pandering, trying to make money by selling another human being for sex. You ready? All right, right thumb. His game with our UC was to try to partner up with her, uh, that he could supply her 
uh, probably high-end tricks uh, because she's a good-looking girl and of course he wants to take his 10% cut. Ultimately that's somewhat of a story that all these girls get sold if they get sucked into it. Ironically, Fereira's tale of broken dreams is not unlike that of many of the girls who come to Vegas. To be a streetwalker, to be a call girl, to be a sauna girl, to be a girl that's in a brothel. This job is the most dangerous job in the world. Annie Lobart says she spent 10 brutal years under the thumb of a pimp as one of Vegas's high-end call girls. I've been raped in beautiful $30,000 suites before with guns to my head from clients. In 1989, Annie came to Vegas from Minnesota for love. The dashing man she thought was her boyfriend turned out to be a brutal pimp. It was the beginning of a sordid, decade-long journey. If you've ever been deprived of the things that you've always wanted, and when someone hands you something, and you're making $3.47 an hour as opposed to $500, $2,000, $5,000 an hour, which we did get in Las Vegas. Trust me, we got that kind of money. That it's so addicting, you can't stop. Annie says the life of a high-class escort is no more glamorous than that of a street prostitute selling herself on the track. The profit may be higher, but the danger is the same. One looks really fun and glamorous and high-class, and then you have the totem pole brothel girl that's chained to the bed. Both of them are in danger because at any given moment, a man can flip on you and turn on you like this. Anti-trafficking advocates say that the general public needs to pay closer attention to the news headlines heralding dead and missing girls. I have had 13 of my friends die from this industry. About 10 of them are unsolved murders. So you're going to highlight Psalm 91. Since escaping the life 10 years ago, Annie founded Hookers for Jesus. When you're in the business working, I mean, this is, this is what we need to hear. When I was working, no one ever came up to me and said, God loves you. No one ever gave me any hope. So these bags are basically, it's a, a gift of hope for the girls to let them know that God still loves them and that there's former working girls that have gotten out of this. Uh, my hands are a little cold. I'm sorry, everyone. We have something called Saturday Night Love Outreach, and we reach out to the women that are currently working on the Las Vegas Strip. And I just have to just ask you, Father God, to just prepare the girls' hearts to let them know that they are not alone, that there's a way out, Lord, and most importantly, Lord, that you died for them and that you would do anything to keep them safe, Lord, and to give them a better life. In no time, Annie spots a young woman on the strip who she suspects is a working girl. That girl right there, she's about to be turned out. She didn't even realize it. You see her? We just walk up to girls, cold turkey, and say, hey, if you need some help, here's my number calls. By the way, here's a gift bag. God loves you. Okay, let's go this way, you guys. Annie leads the group to an area in the casino that is popular for pickup dates. This is usually where we see the girls. Like, there's high traffic here. As Annie cruises the floor, her security team keeps a watchful eye. The possibility of encountering a combative woman or a violent pimp is ever-present. We call it the pimp mafia. If a girl has left her pimp, another pimp will call him, okay, yo, your girl's at Caesar's Palace. Yeah, she's been missing two weeks. Yeah, I got her. She's at the bar right here. Come down here, bro. Get down here now. And all of a sudden, she's found again. The team spots a lone working girl scanning the dance floor, likely looking for a date. Annie moves in for a conversation. I think she's working. Sometimes girls are really receptive. And sometimes girls are standoffish because they're like, wait a second, how do you know I'm working? And then they're looking around like this. Is my pimp watching? They're afraid. This is for you because you're so flipping beautiful. Oh, are you? And I love this video. <laughs> what do you do here? Well, I used to work. You used to work? Really? Like, what type of work? Like, work, work? Really? What happened? Well, you know, when you get tired of the pimps, you got to watch for them because there's a lot here. <laughs> and they beat you down, girl. You got to get away. Okay. You feel me? I understand. Anyway, what's your name? Cassie. Hi, Cassie. Nice to meet you. Nice to I'm Annie. Nice to anyway, take that makeup and make yourself beautiful, all right? Have a good night. Be I safe.
By now, Annie says most casinos and hotels are aware of Hookers for Jesus. Some support her cause, while others would prefer that Annie and her team just go away. Some casinos, they tell us we can't come back. Why? They don't want their guests to be offended. Just minutes into their outreach at a popular casino, Annie is recognized by a supportive security guard. Oh, how are you doing? How's, I'm doing good. How's the ministry? How's we're doing good. We're just uh, we're just walking through, and we're gonna walk over to the. There's there's some girls at the palazzo. We think a lot of girls over there. Listen, we we can. I know you guys are strict here, aren't you? Very strict. But I mean, it happens, and when the guys want it and they're together. I know, you, you can't, can't stop it. But when we see them at any moment by themselves, we ID them, kick them out. As long as this casino's here, there will be hookers. And the reason any is casino. because there are high rollers here. Yeah, They'll that's right. They'll pay $2,000. You, you guys really can't do much about it. Okay. You just can't. And then there's guys. It's from the beginning of time, right? right? It is. No one wants to admit this, but I would believe that almost every casino has house girls. The house girls are the girls that work for the casinos. Annie says she herself was once a house girl for a major Las Vegas casino. When a big spending guest requested a prostitute, Annie would get a call from her contact. The $7,000 fee would be split down the middle, half for Annie, half for the casino. You know what, I used to work this town, if you know what I'm saying. Just as the group is about to call it a night, a young woman catches yeah. Annie's eye. Yeah, I'm a stripper. I work at Cheetos. Okay, listen, please be careful. Yeah, I don't. I had a pimp and everything, girl. Trust me. I've seen it firsthand. They're very aggressive out How here. How old are you? 21. Okay. Oh, baby. I remember when I was 21. Yeah. Oh, my God. You could be my daughter. She said she was 21 and that she was a stripper, but she had tattoos, brandings, pimp brandings all over her body. Hey, listen, you can call us if you need anything. Okay. That's our message is, hey, you're not alone. And we understand because we have been sex trafficked too. If people don't think that it could happen to their children, they're wrong. Today, Annie Lobart says she walks the Vegas Strip hoping to offer salvation and a way out of prostitution for trafficked women. I would like the Johns to know that they're paying for a fantasy that is not true in the least. Ten years ago, she says she was just like them, working this very same strip as a high-class escort. I want them to see that these are broken women that are little girls still inside. Like most young women who end up selling their bodies here, Annie's roots in rural Minnesota lie far from the bright lights of the Vegas Strip. She was a good kid. She was a pretty girl. Her mother recalls that Annie liked to dance and sing in the church choir, loved animals, and participated in local beauty pageants. She was just a, a bundle of energy. I told her, boy, you should be a movie star. <laughs> Beneath the surface of Annie's idyllic childhood, however, things at home were not always so peaceful. Annie says her father was a restless, angry man given to unexpected fits of rage who often lashed out at his family. It was not the most pleasant marriage. We feared him losing it. We feared him having breakdowns. We feared him losing uh, control of his temper. He'd Haul off and hit me. Kids seen that. At 17, craving her independence and freedom from the turmoil at home, she packed her bags and headed for the big city of Minneapolis. I wanted a nice car. I wanted a beautiful home. I wanted beautiful clothes that I never had. It wasn't long before she and an underage girlfriend met a pair of men in a Minneapolis bar. The men wowed them with their Rolex watches, designer suits, and fat wallets. Walked into the club, and these men were sitting there at the bar, and they bought us drinks, and the guy that she ended up being with was a pimp. Annie's friend was swept off her feet and in no time left with the pimp to Hawaii. Within a few weeks, she convinced Annie to come for a visit. And so the first night that I went to Hawaii, I sold myself willingly with her. 
For Annie, this was the first step into a decade-long nightmare of prostitution. Her story is not uncommon. The FBI identified Minneapolis as one of the major hubs of child prostitution in the country. It's a recruiting ground. Poppy Wellman says she was just 15 when she was recruited from her after-school job at a convenience store in nearby Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Two girls kept coming in and they said, would you like to come hang out? And I'm looking at their clothes and looking at the car. And I'm like, yeah. Like Annie, Poppy grew up in an abusive home, making her vulnerable to the older girl's false promises of a more glamorous life. But the girls who Poppy believed to be her new friends were in fact prostitutes who were out recruiting young women for their pimp. And we ended up at this apartment and a couple hours later, here comes this man. They said, this is our man. And he's, they're like, do you wanna choose? Do you wanna be down? Poppy says she was turned out on the street. There, her pimp forced her to have sex with strangers for cash. If people don't think that it could happen to their children, they're wrong. Recent studies of trafficking in the Twin Cities reveal a well-organized network. Much like the slave days of old, the human product is acquired, shipped out, and distributed along well-developed channels. Poppy Wellman says she was trafficked across the Great Plains and eventually taken to Las Vegas, where she was sold as an escort. We went all over. I was sent to Sanas in St. Paul. I was sent over into Nebraska. I was sent to North Dakota, South Dakota, Minot, Aberdeen. Annie Lobart was working at a strip club in Minneapolis when she met the man she thought would be the love of her life. He walked in, it was like my Denzel Washington came to rescue me. Instead of being her savior, Annie says this man became her abuser. The charming man turned sadistic and violent on the very first day that he sold Annie as a prostitute in Vegas. When I told him, I'm not giving you anything, he proceeded to shove my face down in dog feces and tell me this is pimpin' bitch. This is what we came here for. Bitch, you have to submit to me. Annie says every episode of extreme violence was immediately followed by demonstrations of love and promises of a better future. Baby, we're going to get out of this lifestyle. We're going to be multi-billionaires, millionaires. We're going to be the top genre of society. But you have to work hard so we can get there first. Poppy wants the public to understand that being a working girl in Vegas is sheer torture. You take the risk of going to jail. You take the risk of not walking out of that room. Your family disowning you, not wanting to talk to you. You take all the risks and they take none. They take none. They get all, they get all the reward, they get the money. It's a reality, Poppy says, that is invisible to the public and to the partying clients who buy into the fantasy of the happy hooker. We should get Grammys. We should get Oscars for the best acting. It's a facade. We're just trying to put on that so we can make more money. And inside, we're just crumbling. Let's just go through a typical night. I leave my house, I'm all dressed up, it's 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, I gotta work a 12-hour shift. Or I might have to work 24 hours because if my pimp tells me I have to make 2,000 or 5,000, I need to make that quota. So I leave the house with 5, 10 bucks to buy condoms. I have a dollar for McDonald's because they have those dollar burgers, and that's my dinner. And I drive in my car that I don't own because it's his car. And I get a call from my escort agency to go to the Mirage, and I go to the Mirage. And my phone girl tells me, that sends me out my calls, it's a busy night, Fallon. I have 15 calls after this. And my phone girl talks to my pimp, so my pimp knows I have 15 calls. And he tells her, keep her busy, keep her moving. And this night in particular, there's a bunch of bachelor parties. So within those 15 calls, there's 10 clients in each bachelor party. The entire time, I'm smiling and I'm, I'm laughing and I've got the fakest personality on inside of me. But the entire time I know every single dollar I collect, I give to my escort service and my phone girl, and I give the rest to my pimp, and I don't keep anything. All the while, I come home, he wants to have sex with me, but I'm hurting so bad 
that I'm in the shower and I'm trying to wash myself off. And it hurts so bad that the rest of the week, all I can do is give hand jobs and blow jobs because my vagina is sliced in half. Is that the lifestyle that you want to buy? Because that's what happens to all of us. Having endured a decade of daily physical and psychological abuse, Annie says she turned to drugs as a way out. She fell into a vicious cycle of selling herself to pay for an expensive cocaine addiction. That cycle came to an abrupt halt when Annie overdosed and suffered a heart attack. So my whole life flashed before my eyes like a movie and I was in this coffin and I, I was 90 pounds, skeleton. And they said she was just a drug addicted prostitute. She didn't contribute anything to society. On the verge of death, Annie says she made a promise to Jesus. Jesus, if you just, if you just give me a second chance with my life, I'll quit working, I'll quit prostituting, I'll quit doing drugs, and I'll never go back to this. I have had so many false starts with getting my life cleaned up, but there was a point in my life where I said, enough is enough. Annie says the near-death experience saved her. She went on to form a ministry and vowed to help Vegas working girls leave the life. With her growing group of volunteers, Annie is back on the streets of Vegas. Only now she isn't hooking Johns. Like the apostles in the Bible, she's fishing for souls. And I say this to everyone that helps these women, and I say this to myself every day that I wake up. The best thing you can do is love them like your friend. They're coming up to the room right now. Are you guys can copying? You, can they hear us? Charlie's been trying to get you on the radio. Get in the bathroom now. She's walking up right now. Every day in Las Vegas, thousands of exploited women sell the fantasy of the happy hooker to eager men looking to buy sex. All right, Jenna's on trap that she's walking eastbound. Today, Las Vegas Metro deals with the dirty reality of prostitution. Undercover units eye their decoy as she trolls for the men who fuel the black market sale of women. All right, she, uh, there's a small black four-door vehicle has stopped for her. The vehicle's facing um, west right by us. In a matter of minutes, the decoy catches the interest of a slick-looking John. The man claims to work at a big name casino and invites her to join him there to drink beer and hang out. While the decoy tries to convince the John to come to her room, Vegas's top vice cop, Lieutenant Karen Hughes, keeps a close eye on the action from upstairs. She asked if he wants a date. I didn't hear it. Perhaps sensing something fishy, the smooth-talking John speeds off before officers can stop him. I don't think we're going to be able to catch that vehicle. He's uh, gone on trop. So unless, I'm, unless one of the black and whites are out on trop, uh, you can disregard. With the casino John lost to rush hour traffic, the decoy hits the track. All right, uh, battery's changed out and uh, UC's back out. She's uh, walking north on Polaris on the east side. Within a matter of seconds, an older man in a gray SUV waves the decoy over. 40? Yeah, sure. What do you want? 40, you set. She's talking to a guy in a silver Denali. UC room, do you copy? UC room, do you copy? Chavez Leon. As the undercover officer and her senior citizen date make their way to the room, Detective Charlie has trouble reaching his takedown team upstairs. Okay, we're calling into the UC room. He's out of it. The suspect is out of his vehicle. He's walking with her. They're going to be at, going up the stairway that's north of the rooms. With the unknown John just steps from entering the room, the anxiety of the team underscores the potential risk to the undercover officer. Hey, they're, they're coming up to the room right now. Are you guys copying? Can, you, can they hear us? Charlie's been trying to get you on the radio. Get in the bathroom now. She's walking up right now. 
Okay, well, she's like four feet from the door. With only a moment to spare, Detective Charlie makes contact with the undercover team upstairs. We reached right. the uh, okay, UC room. They're ready. <clears throat> All right, they're at the door now. They're about ready to come in. With a confirmed deal of $40 for sex, officers move in for the arrest. The stunned John receives a personal greeting from Lieutenant Hughes in the surveillance room next door. Back towards old mirror. Make it right into the bathroom. Have a seat right there. Lieutenant Hughes, Metro Vice. How are you? Howard's your first name? Uh -huh. Howard, what's your last name? Shaw. What is it? Shaw. Shaw, Howard Shaw? Uh -huh. How old are you, Howard? 60, 66. All right. It's the first time you've been arrested for this? Yes. Never solicited? Have you ever solicited a prostitute before? No, I didn't solicit a prostitute. Well, that wasn't my question. Have you ever solicited a prostitute before? No. Okay. Shaw tells police he was on his way to eat breakfast, and he has no idea why officers have arrested him. What brings you down here today? I was going to breakfast at that Danny's. Okay. All right. Um, do you understand why you're under arrest? Uh, not exactly. Okay. Soliciting prostitution is a misdemeanor in Clark County, all right? Whether you solicit somebody on a street corner or on an internet site, there's always going to be a possibility you're going to get busted by a cop. How do you tell a 70 year old man that it's a, a bag of mixed goods, really, when you're bringing a complete stranger that's as young as your granddaughter back to your room? to engage in an act of prostitution. You ever been a victim of a violent crime? You ever been mugged? It's probably your lucky day that it was two cops instead of two pimps that could have put a gun to your head, taken your wallet. All right, so I want you to think while we're getting you processed, I want you to think about some of the things I've talked about. Denny's wants your business, but the police department doesn't. Shaw continues to deny to our producer, Grace Kong, his intention to pay cash for sex. How often do you buy sex? I never have. This is a, but uh, I never have. Why'd you do it today? Uh, I was going to breakfast at Denny's and uh, this, uh, this gal who was provocatively dressed mm -hmm. and she wasn't a wasn't a teenage girl sure she's she, an adult adult woman yeah she was she was close to 50 you know right and uh, and she's attractive yeah mm -hmm. and uh, she uh, in, in my opinion she solicited me Right, but you always have the power to say no, Howard. Yeah, that's true. Shaw's solicitation will earn him a day in jail and a misdemeanor on his record. We're not going to tolerate the demand side of prostitution. We're not going to tolerate prostitution, period. Turn your body to the right. Turn your whole body to the right. There you go. There's nothing cute about it. There's nothing uh, funny about it. Prostitution is just... It's violent, it's ugly, and uh, it's, not, it's not something that any of us ever take a look at and uh, pat the old guy on the back for just trying to uh, go out and get his groove on. I've been arrested 80, uh, I have been 87 times. Time. I know what to say and what not to say. At this Vegas hotspot for sex on the go, working girls troll the track for tricks while Las Vegas Metro looks on. A Metro undercover gets plenty of offers. Over the course of just a few hours, more than a dozen men in cars, on bikes, and on foot have approached the undercover officer posing as a prostitute. 
The decoy soon discovers there's no rest for the weary. She went in to use the restroom over at uh, one of the gaming establishments and she caught the eye of two older gentlemen coming out. The geriatric duo enthusiastically give their number to the decoy, who promises to call them after she turns another trick. If you and your friend still want to party, give me a call, um, or I'll just come over here. All right, bye. So they exchange phone numbers with her, and here it is, what, two hours later, and she dials them up, and they are back down here within 15 minutes of her phone call, both of them. The UC secures a deal with the two men out of sight of our cameras. One of the old guys got out to buy condoms. Uh, the other one was just waiting right outside. Right when he comes back out, I'll, I'll take it down here. As soon as they pull out of the lot, the men find themselves under arrest. Sir, today you're being arrested for soliciting for the purpose of prostitution. Meet 61-year-old Charles Gibellina. Making deals with them to have sex for money is against the law here in the minute. And his sidekick, 63-year-old Mark Fleischman. Stand right here for just a second. Okay? They said that uh, this was the first time they had ever done this and were hoping to just go home. Okay. At first glance, the two look like a harmless pair of granddads, but their criminal histories tell a far less innocent story. I've been, I've been arrested 80, 80, 87 times. I know what to say and what not to say. You've been indicted 87 times? Wow. I told him anything too good to be true is too good to be true. She was too good to be true? <laughs> That's what I told him. I haven't done that in years. I thought you said you've never done it before. You told Years. me you've never done it before. Years. You guys are going to get processed. These officers are going to take you down. Thank you, Mr. Break. <laughs> There's no breaks. You think we give the working girls breaks? We won't fit you guys. All right. If I could eliminate two of you guys every day, it's two less people that are soliciting working girls for sex. All right? Okay. You guys can't be a part of my problem. I got too much of a problem in Las Vegas. You guys got to be a part of the solution. Put your on. Long story short, they got kids, they got grandkids, you know, they should know better. The only thing that was in their head was catching a break, catching a break today. Charles! Cavalina! You didn't say it right. You used the accent. Cavalina! There you go. There you go. Officers fingerprint, photograph, and search the pair then advise them that their mugs are about to be published on the police website for all the world to see. So how'd you get involved? I was a victim of circle. I was just driving the car. He oh. went in the Dotties to go and talk to him. Right. Yeah. Open your mouth, folks. While being processed, Jibalina shares that he may in fact be a real life good fella. Ah, been here before? Yeah. yeah lift one leg up for me. Jibalina claims to be related to the infamous Belotro brothers, who were immortalized in the Hollywood film Casino. Yeah, my second cousin was one who made the movie about uh, Casino. Oh, really? Cousins, yeah. The Spilatro brothers? Yeah, those are my cousins. Oh, my gosh. man by the name of Tony Spilatro has attracted the attention of law enforcement officials. Spilatro would eventually be linked to as many as 25 mob-related killings. Witnesses died. Spilatro never did suffer a conviction for a violent crime. Much like his cousin Spilatro, Jibalina has somehow managed to avoid any felony convictions, despite a lengthy and serious rap sheet. Right. Sir, have you ever done any prison time? No. no. Good. That's why I said this is a disgrace to add to my resume. Yeah, especially <laughs> at your age. <laughs> well, I've been retired. Have you? Oh, no, yes, I'm retired. I got one year, a year, year and a half. Uh, in the last day you have to see him. Wow, sorry to hear that, man. Well, get yourself better. Stay out of here, because this won't keep, keep, keep you healthy. No. All right. All right, you're under arrest? On my own? For what? With every arrest, the Vegas Vice Squad chips away at the commonly held belief that prostitution is a benign crime in Sin City and not one worth enforcing. Am I going to jail? Yes, unfortunately you are too. Prostitution is not as simple and as dismissive um, as a misdemeanor crime. It's no harm, no foul. There's no victims. The women that we deal with uh, involved in this uh, very ugly uh, sex trade are the most vulnerable. 
And then you can add on top of that the juveniles, the kids that are getting drug into this. They're, nobody wants to see that, uh, but that is, that's prostitution. As Vegas Metro works to disrupt supply and demand, Annie Lobart and Hookers for Jesus continue to patrol the strip, offering a lifeline to the victims of a rigged game where she says women always lose. I have no doubt in my mind, not only one girl, not only 10 girls, not only 100, but there is probably thousands of women that want to get out at any time in Vegas. And if they could, they would.